Welcome to the Association 100 podcast. The A100 podcast is an extension of our Association 100 bi-monthly newsletter that focuses on best practices, top trends, helpful ideas, and smart strategies and tactics that work in the world of associations. The podcast will feature meaningful conversations with association professionals across the country, taking a deeper dive into trending topics, offering insights that both inform and inspire. Welcome back to the A100 podcast. I'm Megan Henning, and I'm joined today by my co-host, Kevini Hewitt. I'm thrilled to welcome Carter Allman, Director of Government Affairs and Science Policy at the American Society for Pharmacology and Experimental Therapeutics. Welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here today with you guys. Thank you. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your association and your members? So we are a 6,000 person member-based association. Uh, Our members conduct basic research. So really what it is, discovering how uh, drug compounds interact with the body um, to help cure diseases. So they are really the first step in development of brand new treatments, uh, therapies, drugs that ultimately one day make it to market or their discoveries um, are later used with other discoveries to find um, the new different uh, cures. Which is so cool. So your role involves advocating for the interests of pharmacologists and researchers. What are some of the current policy issues or even challenges that the society is addressing? So I would say the first real issue that we face, and and unfortunately it's a uh, cyclical one, is funding for biomedical research. Um, Our biomedical research agencies, that's like the NIH, National Institute of Health, National Science Foundation, FDA, all of those, really are the true incubators of discovery in America and our area. What happens is typically that's the first one to get cut through appropriations, which then leads to us going to the Hill and advocating for more money or continue level of money, which is really doesn't sound good, but at least trying to stop the bleed, because without this funding, we're going to lose our footing on the global market. Other countries are going to make these discoveries, and we're just going to be in a place of catching. Other issues that we have been working on deal with allowing researchers access to Schedule 1 uh, drugs for testing in okay. research. Typically, if it's on the Schedule 1 category, it's a lot more hoops to jump through, a lot more paperwork, and it really slows down the discovery. Uh, As we all know, fentanyl is in the news, other things like that. Those have really high bars of access to them for our researchers. So we can't find that drug. Naloxone was born out of the opioid research. That may be lying within some sort of fentanyl analog, but with having to go through all the steps to procure a Schedule One license, we're not gonna get there as quick as we could if there was some sort of expansion where if there was one individual in that lab that had a Schedule One, everybody else had Schedule Two licenses, they could work under that Schedule One because they're all in the same lab. It's all within the same component instead of everybody then having the paperwork to get there. So that would be another area that we are really advocating. Okay. And how do you involve your members in that? A lot of it is listening to our members and educating our members. Scientists by nature aren't really in this sort of sphere. They look at advocacy more as the political side. But really advocacy is standing up for yourself, for your industry, and really storytelling, sharing that story. We have a program called the Washington Fellows Program where we take 10 early career scientists to the Hill after they've done a sort of a policy seminar. And when they discuss the issues, the two that I laid out, 
they also share their research and that's where the connection really happens. It's not so much what is on that sheet of paper or where our advocacy stance is, it's that direct connection from the research to what it really means. Uh, we had a recent member that was doing research on e-cigarette use in pregnancy and discussing with the congressional staffer and she all of a sudden started clicking, oh, this is not good, e-cigarettes aren't good for me. We need those types of connections form when they have a chance and they feel comfortable talking about their research, not so much on the, let's say, the scientific level, but really in the everyday. Which is great because you're not just bringing expert testimony or something like that, you're literally bringing the experts you're bringing, there to have these conversations, which is great. Exactly. I, I think sometimes our members and general people who belong to associations, they hear advocacy, that's what they exactly go to is sitting in that chair yes. with 20 <laughs> different congressmen or yes. congresswomen and senators, and it's adversarial. Once you go into the office, they want to hear from you because you are their constituents, and a constituent is a vote. Yes. Yeah. And that's who they want to make sure they keep happy are really the voters. Makes perfect sense. So how does your association stay informed about the latest developments and policy changes at both federal and state levels? I'm sure there's <laughs> lots all the time. So how do you keep track of all of that? Really on the state level, we really just rely on our members and our outside coalitions to really keep us up to date on what's going on there. Uh, we're more of a national focus. We have a staff of two, so it's hard to capture all 50 states, as well as what's going on in Congress and the agencies. Federally, we use various different softwares, again, with our coalitions and in getting involved with those. Really, it's about sharing information, sharing comment letters, you know, opportunities to go to the Hill. That's great. It's not so much siloing and you got the inside track. It's making sure everybody knows because there is a value to have going more voices. Yes. And then do you have any recent advocacy successes that you want to highlight or anything you think would be interesting? I think the, we'll say the first one that comes to mind is last year, omnibus bill at the end of the year, the 2020, FY 2023 bill, where it really gave a lot more money to the science agencies. Congress gave more money to the agencies. And that was really behind a lot of the advocacy, a lot of the story that they were telling that showed the importance and the need to have that funding level. Now there were some polit political portions to that. We can't claim any sort of credit towards that, but we really were happy that our advocates got out there, really talked about it and really engaged. As the field of pharmacology and experimental therapeutics continues to change, how do you keep your members at the forefront of all of that scientific information? It just seems that it's constantly changing. There's different things that are coming up. and So how do you keep the members up to date? So that's a good question. That's something that we struggle with all the time is how to make sure that aspect is in front of our members and they're getting that information. So we have a whole host of various techniques we use. We're very active now on social media. LinkedIn happens to be like our most successful channel to get information out. We also, this past year, held our very first annual meeting by ourselves in That's the last exciting. 30 years. So that was really exciting. Yes. A lot of information got shared there. We also use targeted webinar programming. We have a great program called Focus on Pharmacology, where the various divisions can highlight their cutting edge information. We also publish four scientific journals. We're really pushing out information and content as much as possible. Which is great, because then you get to be known by your members that you're the go-to place. It's great. It is, and that's part of our new strategic plan, is to be the home for pharmacology. 
So we're still rolling out and working on a whole host of other areas that, to get this information out and provide that member benefit as well as the societal benefit. So how do you foster connections then with your members and other stakeholders in the scientific community? You mentioned that you just had this annual meeting. Are there other ways that you're reaching out with this with Hill or different stakeholders within the scientific community to just make sure that there's a bridge between all the members and all that's going on? So we're very, say, open about sharing the public affairs email address so they can contact us there, phone number. That's great. They can reach out to us that way. We also have advocacy alerts that go out so they can actually make that connection between themselves and their member of Congress. Uh, we actually will hold listening sessions when major pieces of regulatory RFIs come out. We held one earlier this year when NIH was looking at the postdoc experience, postdoctoral experience going from, hey, how to improve it, NIH is really looking into it because they're seeing a sort of slippage with PhDs, which really isn't good within the science community. So really engaging the members where they are and how they want to be engaged has been critical for us. That's great. That's awesome. And then I know you mentioned the big annual meeting you guys just had, some other listening sessions, but are there any other upcoming events or initiatives that you guys are excited to, to launch or have coming up? So I think the one major one that we're really excited for is our 2024 Washington Fellows Program. We put a lot more um, energy into that in years past to really revamp it, uh, to give our early career scientists a well-rounded experience, expose them to that sort of career path. Uh, the majority of our members go into the academic, at the bench type of field. We are seeing members want to see what else is out there, and watch the Fellows Program it gives them that experience to see the policy world, and that's just not how I would view it as a traditional, okay, you're going to go work in Congress, you're going to work in the state, but also working for one of the federal agencies or working for an association. So giving them that exposure to see everything. Uh, we're still very excited about our advocacy center. We're working on revamping some of the resources there to really begin to engage our members more and give them the confidence to really become a part of the conversation and not just us tagging them every time there's a fire drill in Congress. <laughs> we need they need to hear from you. No, we want you to he want them to hear from you regularly. And do you have any suggestions? I think for we've spoken to several several members who are in associations with science, and there's all of this politics over the of science. Do you have any advice to other associations on how to stay the course and maybe not delve into the to the politics? This delves more into my, this is my personal feeling and not that of my organization, but science is political. You can't have science without politics. I think case in point is the major blockbuster right now, Oppenheimer. Yes, that's if such he, a good point, yes. Without the funding and the effort of the federal government that atomic age never would have happened. It would have just languished on a blackboard someplace. Keeping that in the back of your mind, that yes, politics and science go hand in hand because they have to. Because science really is about the public and public well-being and health. There is political side of it, but politics play an important part in every other part of our lives. Why shouldn't this be any different? I love this so, answer. Yes. Yeah. Now, for the where my association would probably like me to say is we try to stay above the fray as much as possible, sure. but there is still some coloring of the politics, and it really somewhat changes how you go in to an office. Some offices, you're going to walk in and they're going to say, yes, we agree with you 100%. Thank you. Have a nice day. Those are the five-minute meetings that you're like, okay, great doesn't really make my advocate look get the full experience <laughs> then you go into some other offices where it's 
you're fighting tooth and nail just just actually we'll say fact check or set the record straight again not a wonderful experience for the advocate because it scares them off it's an adversarial so what we try to do is set them up for success give them the chance to tell their story teach them how to tell their story so that when they walk in that's so important too yeah that's great that they know whatever happens their story got told why they were there why this research that is being funded is critical it's not just because the government somebody was handing out the grant money no this is critical because it may not be that moonshot cure for cancer but it could be that piece that is missing to somebody else that's great perfect way to put that so now switching gears to some fun lightning just fun right. questions <laughs> so first one is where did you grow up so i grew up in caddis ohio which was the home of clark gable king of Hollywood I yes. down the street from his childhood home so it's a little town in eastern Ohio exciting what is your go-to Starbucks order so I'm really boring it is usually a venti bold roast no groom just give it black I'm sure the Starbucks employees thank you for that yes I yes, was gonna yes, say yes, yes. I am, I am, they must love you yes. <laughs> and I'm typically the one they go is that all <laughs> Like, yes. yes. Are you sure? <laughs> That's great. Yes. I don't need a chemistry set to make my drink. <laughs> so if you won the lottery tomorrow, would you still work? Would I still want to work if I won the lottery? Yes. I would still want to work. I, especially in associations. Whether I like the, my current association, I, it really does great work. I definitely would like to stay there if I won the lottery. It, that I is just, a real testament to your association. It, it is. I, I found some place that I really enjoy. They've given me the room to grow and the opportunities to do that. Would I work normal hours? I'm sure for a donation I could probably work Congress's hours. <laughs> you know, that would be great, yes. Quarter of the year I'm working, the other half I'm doing quote-unquote district work, whatnot. Maybe so. drive to work in a super fancy car? No, no, I, no. I, I, <laughs> That's what I would do. Yeah. I have two young daughters. I love my minivan. That is, I'm a minivan dad. It is perfect. <laughs> I don't need a fancy car. It is, others out there will disagree, but the fancier the car you get, the more in trouble you have, you can get into. This is true. This is true. I'll have to remember that in case I ever win the lottery. Exactly. Um, what is the last show that you binge watched? The last show I binge watched. With the amount of streaming we do nowadays, I actually have to think about this. I would say season two of Lincoln Lawyer and the new Justify. Prim- Primordial City, I think it is. Okay. What is a food you can't live without? Definitely meat. I know that's a ter- <laughs> that that's no. such a broad I would say if I had to narrow it down, probably steak. I love to grill. I'm I cook in the house, so nice. um, I have all sorts of gizmos and gadgets. <laughs> My wonderful wife is forgiving in that sense because she's you've ruined a lot of restaurants for me because I can just have you cook it for me at home. <laughs> and I'm like, I know. I love that. <laughs> and then last but not least, what's your bucket list travel destination? My bucket list travel destination. I'd love to get over to Europe, especially like Ireland, England. I'd like to see Germany. I just like to get on the continent and take their trains. I love mass transit. I'm very jealous of the fact that they have trains connecting every one of their cities and just being able to travel by that. Oh, nice. I love that. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us live from ASAE here in Atlanta. And we really appreciate talking to you. Thank you so much. This has been a wonderful experience. And I hope you guys have a good rest of the conference. And that's a wrap on today's episode. Thanks for listening to the Association 100 podcast brought to you by the A100 publishing team, powered by Onward and Upward Marketing and Communications. You can subscribe to the Association 100 podcast on Spotify so you'll never miss out. Or listen via our website at theassociation100.com. Follow us for all the latest insights and trends impacting the world of associations. Thanks for tuning in.